Hey all, I am Darren, head of remote at GitLab. And in this presentation, I am going to flip your notion of remote work entirely on its head. And I'll leave you with actionable takeaways that you can use to implement right away to thrive while remote. So I wanna start by asking you a question. What comes to mind when you hear working from home? So it may actually look something like this fella here, uh, but the point is everyone has a different interpretation of what remote work means. We've all had different experiences with it, some good, some bad, some neutral. Uh, but in a world today where we're all moving towards remote, whether we like it or not, companies are facing a new reality. And that is they need to build the infrastructure to support a remote workforce and not only support them, but enable them to thrive. And so in this presentation, I'm gonna to talk to both workers, the people that are contributing from home, as well as team leaders who are now facing the situation of how do we stand this up? How do we implement processes? How do we change culture? So a bit of background on me. So I've had over 14 years of remote work experience across the entire spectrum of remote. So I've worked in co-located companies. I've worked in hybrid remote scenarios where a subset of the company goes into the office each day and a subset works remotely. And at GitLab, it's an all remote company. So we have 1,200 people across over 65 countries with no company owned offices. And so I'm packaging up all of that experience across all of those workplaces to share some of the things that we've learned, some of the trials and tribulations we've been, been through to help you and your teams thrive. A bit of background about GitLab. So GitLab was actually all remote from the very beginning. The first three employees at the company were in different countries, and so they were remote by nature. And when they went to Y Combinator, uh, they did get an office and it lasted about three days. And after that, people stopped showing up and the work continued to get done. Uh, and the founders were wise enough to document their processes and their culture from the very beginning. And now we have a public handbook that if you printed it out, would run over 5,000 pages. But it all started as one page, writing down what mattered to us, writing down our com core company values, writing down how we did things, how we thought about things. And that all of that is still public today. And actually a bit of what I'm gonna to touch on is the importance of working handbook first, the importance of making documentation a core value, and the importance of being public and transparent. Remote forces you to be transparent. When you can't see people, you need to trust that they have the information they need and they're going to use it to the betterment of themselves and their colleagues and the company. So we believe that all remote is the purest form of remote work. There's no two tier type of citizenship. Everyone is on a level playing field. But I realize that most companies don't have that luxury. You can't just unwind all the way back to the days when you did not have an office. And so what we're going to talk about applies to pretty much every company, including hybrid remote companies and even co-located companies can stand to learn, learn a thing or two from this. So the reality is even if you're in a co-located space and let's say you have an office in London and one in Singapore, the people in those offices are already remote to each other. And so it behooves you to put these remote first practices in place even if you never actually intend to hire a remote worker. Because if you need those two offices to communicate more seamlessly and be more empathetic towards each other, adding remote first practices even to a co-located company can really pay dividends. Now, a lot of companies are coming to this presentation with a harsh reality. They have been thrust into remote. They are suddenly remote. They have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of employees that now have to work from their home and they had no warning, there was no operational preparation. Maybe their homes aren't even set up for that. And so while this will touch on how do we solve the here and now issue to get us through our new reality of we can't go into the office, I wanna give you a little bit of a forecast on why this matters well beyond the here and now. There's long-term implications for laying the right remote infrastructure now because it will put you in a better position coming out of this such that even when you can send your employees back to the office, the truth is many of them are gonna choose not to. And you may actually recognize that, you know, maybe to de-risk our business, we should diversify where people can work from. Maybe we shouldn't tie ourselves so closely to one or two pieces of geography. So the long-term upside is excellence. You get operational discipline in remote that you can easily bypass in a co-located space. 
efficiency. This is by far the most efficient way to work instead of tying people to a rigid set of hours plus forcing them to commute in and commute out every day. By decoupling time and work, you're able to get a much more efficient workforce, especially at scale. An opportunity. This should become a core part of your talent strategy. Brilliant people live all over the world. Many of them do not want or cannot relocate to some of the major job centers of the world. And frankly, they may experience a lower quality of life in doing that. So you have to recognize that you're missing out on a lot of talent and a lot of loyal talent by not tapping into the world as you're recruiting pipeline. So let's start with some of the key challenges in embracing remote, especially if you've been thrust into it. Workspace is a key one for workers. The common question is, what if my home isn't designed to be an office? The second one is communications. You might hear, we never thought about structuring our communications and now it's an urgent need. How do we ensure that communications go everywhere when we don't even know where people are? And how do we prevent communication silos? And how do we commit, com prevent communications from becoming fractured across various channels? And then finally is the mindset. You can have all the tools in the world, but if you do not have a cultural mindset that is based in trust instead of fear and micromanagement, it's likely that your remote efforts are going to be thwarted. So keep that in mind as we go through these next slides. And truly, you will have to break all the rules. And some of the things in remote will seem awkward, especially if you're comparing it directly to an in-office experience until it doesn't. But here's the thing. You can't just copy the in-office experience and paste it into a virtual world, and nor would you want to. The remote world allows you to do much more innovative things across all fronts, which we're gonna to touch on next. Now, I wanted to share one thing really quickly about how GitLab gets things done. So in a period of transition, my general advice is minimize your tool stack. People are going to be experiencing workplace change. They're going to be experiencing cultural change. You want to minimize change. And so if you're going to introduce a new tool, make sure you think it through and make sure you allow current tools to stay in place as people transition out. And whatever you do, ensure that you stand up a remote leadership team for people to be there when people are transitioning to new tools to give you feedback and help them adapt and acclimate. But honestly, all of GitLab gets things done with four key core tools. We use Zoom for video chats. The reason we choose Zoom is that it scales really well. We frequently have company all hands with 600, 700 people in a simultaneous call and there's no stuttering or buffering. It's amazing for massive, massive teams. We use Slack and I'll touch a bit on how we use Slack differently than almost anyone else uses it. But we do use Slack for company communications. We use the G Suite, Google Docs, Google Slides. Those are essential to what we do. We do use Gmail, but we minimize our use of email. Essentially, email is only there to operate with non get labbers the outside world. We try to do almost no work in email, and I'll explain why. The last and most important tool is GitLab, the product itself. We actually host our 5,000-page handbook on GitLab, and all changes, merge requests, proposals, they all come in through GitLab, the product. And that enables and empowers our entire team to make a proposal to change anything in our handbook. And then that goes to the DRI, the code owner of the section, and they're able to either edit that change or push that change live or reject that change. We also use GitLab for all of our project management. So even our non-dev and engineering teams like marketing and finance, we use GitLab to manage everything end to end. And the reason we do this is it is a tool built by a fully remote team for remote teams with asynchronous workflows in mind. So we intentionally use this tool to manage our projects because it enables us to move projects forward regardless of time zone. It minimizes our need for synchronicity. It minimizes our need for meetings. So it helps us in our remote world. I want to touch a bit on what we've learned from our trials and tribulations and also give you a few anecdotes on how we think. And I want you to consider this section as you're thinking about your mentality of remote work. Think about what it could look like if you saw it through a slightly different lens. A lot of this doesn't require major sea changes in how you think, it's just a slight twist on the norm. So it starts with the value of a single source of truth. 
So one of the core issues you'll see in a remote team is information is everywhere. You don't know what to trust. You don't know what's the latest. You don't know what's the most up-to-date or who has the right information. A single source of truth for GitLab is our handbook. And we work handbook first. I would encourage any remote team to start a handbook now. You can use Notion if you want to get started quickly. GitLab pages will help you get up and running as well. The, the thing this, to focus on here is just start. It will start as one page. And if you want a shortcut, just start it as an FAQ and start answering some basic questions that your newly remote team are asking. Things like, how do we put in for PTO? Who do I call if this breaks? What if I can't get Okta to connect? What do I, who do I go to for an access request? Some of these basic questions, instead of answering them ad nauseum every time someone asks, document it. Document the answer to some of these frequently asked questions. And as you iterate on that document every day, more and more things will be answered. And then it will become a more comprehensive document. And eventually we'll get to the point where even people that join down the road will be able to look back at what you documented today and benefit from it. It's the notion of paying it forward. So this helps us to embrace asynchronous workflows. We want to get as much documentation down in a single source so that anyone can access it without having to tap someone on their virtual shoulder because people may be asleep or out playing with their kids or doing anything. We hire managers of one. People are, people are empowered and expected to manage their own time, not to necessarily be in a seat at a given time. That's really only possible if you provide them the information in a transparent way. And that just goes right into building trust and community. We all have to trust each other that we're working toward a common goal. And with that single source of truth, everyone knows what the common goal is. It's all documented for everyone to see. Information is in one place. So we all have a common North Star to rally around. I want to talk about some of the things we do differently on the communication front. So here's how we think about communicating at a base level. Every answer should be a link. And I kind of alluded to this in the prior slide, but I want to give you an actual example here. So every time a new hire joins the team, inevitably they'll have a bunch of questions that almost new, every new hire has. And when they ask me a question, my goal is to be able to answer back every single time with a link that points them to a handbook page that explains the answer to whatever they're after. This is a highly respectful, highly inclusive, highly efficient way to communicate. It shows respect for this person's time, allows them to take that handbook page, read it, ingest it, and learn it on their own time. And it also triggers one other thing, which is if I get asked a question and I cannot think of a handbook link or I cannot search and find a handbook link, what it immediately tells me to do is to go find the answer for this person, convey the answer, and then go put this in the handbook and create a link such that every person that comes after who would ask the same question can now have that link to find. At scale and extrapolate it over time by documenting answers such that you can answer with a link, your team gains massively on the efficiency front. Another thing about tools and using them slightly differently in a remote setting is how we use Slack. So we expire our messages after 90 days. And this usually gets a confused look. Why would you do that? We do it very intentionally so that people won't work in Slack. If you know that you can't simply go query a term and see how work progressed in Slack, you won't use Slack for work. So this acts as a, for a forcing function to do our work in GitLab the product, not in Slack. So that's the first reason we do it. The second reason we do it actually works to solve a common issue in remote, which is, how do you build relationships? How do you get people to communicate and connect in a real way, in a way that mimics being in an office? So because we can't use Slack for work, it's really only good for one thing, and that's informal communication. And so if you look in the GitLab handbook on our communication page, you'll see that we have a ton of topical channels, everything from music to hiking to video games to mental health to parenting. And the parenting one I love because it allows all of the parents at GitLab to join in one channel. And we can ask each other things like, hey, my seven-year-old won't get dressed in the morning and go to school. Does anyone else have a crazy seven-year-old with any tips? And what's awesome about that is it's pure informal communication. And it's the kind of thing that probably wouldn't naturally happen in a co-located space. But when you only use Slack for things like that, 
we're able to have really authentic, genuine conversations with ourselves and actually feel more connected to my team in a more intimate way than I would conversing with somebody in a co-located space. And that just takes a slight tweak in how you think about using a tool that you're probably already using. Now, I won't dive too deep into these other uh, areas here, but we will provide links on how we think about meetings. And the, the, the shortcut there is don't have a meeting if there's not an agenda. And if you get a, a meeting invite and there's no agenda, you're welcome to decline it. And this puts a heavy burden on meetings so that people don't default to meetings first. You want to make sure it has to have an agenda so that it's transparent, everyone can see it. And then it's on the meeting organizers to then document any takeaways in the handbook. We place a heavy burden on meetings, yet another forcing function, so that we think about how do we move this project forward without a meeting? Is it possible to do this without a meeting? That's the mindset you want to be in. I want to touch one more time on staying connected. So this is really big for remote teams. A lot of people feel like if they leave the office, they don't get that genuine bond with people. So as a remote team, you have to be very intentional about structuring informal communications. Because what would happen spontaneously in an office will not happen unless your people group establishes a runway for people to communicate. So consider uh, weekly or monthly show and tell calls or talent calls. Like invite your kids to the room. Maybe they'll do some crazy trick and then let the team vote on it and see who uh, expressed the craziest talent. Uh, invite people to have coffee chats. Just have a topical room in Slack or Teams where people can just come in there and say, hey, I just need to blow off steam for 20 minutes. And what I encourage people to really think about here is don't overthink this. Informally communicate the same way you would in an office. So let's say you're in an office and after a couple of meetings, you just need to go walk to the coffee machine or water cooler. And you're going to grab another person and talk about sports or music or what you're doing this weekend. You can do that exact same thing but virtually. Just tap someone on their virtual shoulder or have a room where people can volunteer. That way you're not interrupting people. Throw together a Zoom call, invite people in. You actually may find that there are more people that wanna converse about whatever topic you wanna to converse about, whereas that's mostly gonna be a one-to-one -one or maybe one-to-two thing in an office. So it's an even more inclusive way to do it. But the thing is, most people aren't familiar with doing this. So as a people group, you need to urge people, push people, show people how to do it. And again, it'll seem awkward until it doesn't, and then it will become second nature. This is how you communicate. The other cool thing there is when you let people be remote, you invite them to bring their whole selves to work, their whole home, their whole background, wherever it may be. And meetings are about the work, not the background. A lot of people have a stigma attached to, I need my background to be as sterile and clean as the office. Throw that away. In a remote setting, none of that matters. Invite people into your home or your co-working space, wherever that may be. If your kid comes into the meeting, that's awesome. It's not a bad thing. Uh, what a cool thing it is to be home in your family while you're also able to work. It takes a slight mental shift, but when you embrace that and you make sure that's known culturally, company-wide, it enables people to just have fun with it. So I want to look at five things that you can implement today in your journey to remote? What are the things that you can do right now? The first thing to do is if you're at home, carve out a dedicated workspace. So if you're in a home big enough that you can devote a room to it, that's ideal. If you're in a small one bedroom apartment, find something that's makeshift. Even if you just hang a curtain or a towel or something to block off a space where you're going to work so that it creates a clear delineation between where you're working and where you're living. That physical separation is absolutely key. And this goes into separating work from life. Burnout is a real thing, and it is definitely possible to get burned out when you're working from home. And it's important to make intentional efforts to separate work from life because it's all too easy for sleep to just kind of blur into work, to just kind of blur into sleeping again, and you lose track of time, lose track of so if you're just sh shifting to remote now, one thing I would recommend is proactively planning the time that you would usually spend commuting. So maybe you proactively plan to just rest more, totally fine, but replace it with something proactively. Replace it with cooking, replace it with exercise, replace it with uh, e-learning with your children, replace it with calling relatives or friends, replace it with writing notes or a gratitude journal, anything but be deliberate about replacing it with something. This helps you to wake up, 
ramp into the day doing something intentional in place of the commute, and then ramping out of the day doing something in place of the commute. And you'll quickly find that those are a lot more awesome than the actual commute. Uh, and you'll probably see that once that genie is out of the bottle, you're going to have a hard time going back and you'll start to understand why remoters love the freedom and autonomy that they have. Don't stop engaging with people. If you normally communicate with people around the coffee machine or water cooler, keep doing that. As I mentioned, you just have to be a little bit more proactive about that uh, and experiment with some video based chat tools. It's also something to consider if you're a team leader to just have a Zoom link that's kind of always on kind of like a hotel lobby. So if anybody wants to come hang out, we're here in the hotel lobby. You can come when you please, leave when you please, no expectations, let's just hang out. Respect the routine, but give yourself permission to experiment with change. So here's the deal on routines. A lot of people will say, if you're thrust into remote, make sure you keep the same routine that you have when you're going into the office. And there's some truth to that. Sometimes routine helps people stay focused on doing the work when you need to do it and then getting away from work when you need to get away from it. But here's the thing, recognize that when you're working remotely, you do have more freedom in your day. And so I would say experiment with change, be open and communicative about it with your team if you're gonna start working odd hours, but this actually enables you to have an honest conversation. And if you work better in the evenings or kind of off peak hours, remote is gonna be amazing for you. You can kind of enjoy your morning, maybe go outside, go for a walk, start your day a little bit later, and then kind of work into the evening when it's dark anyway, where your peak productivity is. This also helps to force the asynchronous nature of work. If you don't have people on at the exact same hours, it, it just encourages you to think about work more from an asynchronous standpoint. Now, I know this might not be practical for all companies right away, but think about it and work towards it. For most employees, this is a major perk. And so if you're looking for ways to kind of give back to your workers when they're in a suboptimal environment, allowing them to experiment with their day and live a non-linear workday could be something that creates massive gains. And lastly, roll with the changes. Here's the thing. It's all going to be a process and you're going to have to iterate on it daily. If you're a team leader and you're thinking about opening a brand new, brand new office in New York City, what are the chances that the office is going to work flawlessly on day one? Probably not. You're going to have key fobs that don't work. The elevator may get stuck. Maybe lunch shows up late. Maybe it's too hot. It's too cold. It's not going to be perfect. But no one just leaves the office after day one if it's not perfect. And the same should be thought about remote. Go into it. Add new tools. Add new processes on how you use those tools. But be willing to roll with the changes. Iterate as you go. Create a feedback mechanism so that everyone can provide feedback. And I would recommend implementing a documentarian or a remote leadership team where people can put this down on paper. And there are daily or weekly standups that go through all of these. And for your executive team, let your EA be that documentarian. And if you have friction in how you normally communicate or get information, let them write this down and you will see themes that emerge from this, communication gaps or voids that need to be filled. And as you see themes that are mentioned more often than not, that creates your priority list on what do we fix first. And before you know it, a few weeks in, you'll be way better than you were a month ago. And then three months in, you'll start to think, ah, why didn't we do this sooner? And even if you bring people back into the office, because let's face it, some people like the office and some people just aren't built to work remote. These foundational practices that you lay now will help your team work more efficiently, no matter where people are. If it's in a co-working space, if it's on an airplane, if it's in a hotel room, or if it's back in the office. Listen, we're all in this together. If your company just became a remote team, welcome. You have an amazing opportunity ahead of you. And if you're looking for more specific tips, please, please visit allremote.info. I've authored over 30 guides on how GitLab thinks about every part of remote from asynchronous workflows to handbook first, to how we do meetings, even how we hire and compensate people across 65 plus countries in the world. And we're building more all the time. There's even a guide there on how to think about a non-linear workday. So if you're an employee and you're thinking, what do I do with this? How do I imagine what my day could be like? We have some awesome prompts there. We have tools for leaders, tools for executives, and guides for workers as well. Please join the All Remote conversation on Twitter and in LinkedIn with the hashtag All Remote. 
And feel free to get in touch with me, Darren. I am at Darren Murph on Twitter. Thank you so very much for listening. Feel free to create a merge request or leave feedback in true GitLab fashion. We are always iterating and we very much appreciate the feedback. Mahalo and aloha.